Who gets confused or discombobulated around daylight savings time, spring ahead, fall back, all that stuff? I seem to never be able to figure it out. Is it going to be darker earlier, darker later, whatever? I have to relate it to what time do I, what's the latest time to make a tea time and still finish? And it's lousy now. I have to get started by about noon. So that's no good. I think the disciples had the same challenge, too. Look at what Jesus had to say to them in Matthew 25, 13. Stay awake, for you know neither the day nor the hour. That's how I feel. I don't know what time it is. Or to quote those famous Americans from the band Chicago. Does anybody really know what time it is? Does anybody really care? Does anybody really know what time it is? Does anybody, Does anybody really care? We just need to deal with it, right? All right, so no worries as the time changes. We're going to fall back. Today we're going to look at why it's important for us to fall back. It's important to fall back to God, to fall back to a life that's more honorable. We're going to look at that. Falling back to a deeper relationship with our Lord and Savior. We see the outcome of that relationship evidenced in a life that's more honorable and a life that is blessed beyond our imagination. That blessed life can be our life. We're going to dig into one tiny little passage of scripture that's tucked away in the Old Testament. Who's heard of the prayer of Jabez? Some. Most people miss this important information that God has given us. I love to mine little nuggets from God's word. It's just fun. Look at, uh, so we're going to get into that. Look at 1 Chronicles 4, 9, and 10. Two verses buried deep in page after page of boring genealogies, and yet there it is, screaming at us, hey, I'm important, read me, study me, find out why I'm here. Two little verses. Here they are. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, oh, that you would bless me indeed, and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I may not cause pain. And finally, so God granted him what he requested. Thank the Lord he told us that as well. Now Paul tells us in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. That's all scripture, not some, not just the exciting parts, not just the parts we agree with or the parts we understand or that are easy to read, but all scripture. The Holy Scripture introduces us to Jabez here. The Holy Spirit introduces us to Jabez here and gives us his prayer for a reason. All right, all scripture is there for a reason. Let's dig into it and find that reason so we can be equipped as the Lord wants us to be. As we move through the outline today, we'll mine God's truths from Jabez's prayer, We'll learn a little bit about who this guy was and uncover some tips about living a blessed life. Before we pull apart Jabez's prayer, let's go over some basics that most of us already know. What do I mean when I say fall back to God? Well, those of you who know me know this is true. I have a bad tendency to run ahead of God. He sets me on a path, gives me instructions, assures me he'll be with me, shows me the goal, gets me started. And I'm on this path that looks like this. It's very clear. It's a beautiful path. I know where I'm going. I'm enjoying the path. But what do I do? Right after I get started, I begin to run full speed ahead. He gave me the goal, so I'm going to it as fast as I can get there. I don't look around. I don't seek guidance. I'm just getting somewhere fast. Anybody relate? I begin leading and not following. When this happens, I typically wander off his path, even as I'm still running full speed ahead. I miss a turn and sometimes run straight into the trees. <laughs> I'm going as fast as I can get to where he sent me. The big problem is I get out ahead of God. Anybody ever feel like that? 
It's when I finally slow down, take a deep breath, look around, find that I'm out in the wilderness, which you just saw. Or as you've heard me call it, the ugly zone. Well, how did I get in the ugly zone again? It's like I'm always there. I'm, I'm, I live in the ugly zone, and yet I'm, I start out in God's awesome path, right? I was just there a minute ago, but then I'm in the ugly zone again. But God has not left me. I've left him. I've gotten out in front. It's at those times when I realize I need to fall back to God. I need to get praying. I need to get into his word. I need to be sure I'm seeking godly counsel from godly people. Basically, I need to be spending time cultivating spiritual disciplines. I need to sharpen my axe. That brings us to our first point, number one. Fall back to the basics of our relationship with God. What do I mean when I need to sharpen my axe? There was a lumberman who was extremely productive, and yet his productivity and his workload, his productivity decreased and his workload increased. And it continued to do that. He was working his little tail off and producing less and less and less and less and less. Working harder and harder and harder. Till one day his boss comes out and he's talking to him and says, What is up? You used to be so great, now you're not so great. Boss looks at his axe and he says, your axe is dull. You need to sharpen your axe. The lumberman says, I don't have time to sharpen my axe. I've got too many trees to cut. We need to sharpen our axes. Isn't that where we are a lot of times? We just keep doing the same thing, and it's harder and harder and harder, and we're getting fewer results. We need to back off, slow down, regroup, sharpen our axe, practice our spiritual disciplines, Get with our Lord. Put it another way, we need to be on the path to becoming disciples. By the way, rabbit trail, first one. Becoming a disciple is our goal, right? And we will always be becoming a disciple. We will never arrive. Amen? Before I get into the spiritual disciplines, let me ask everyone. At Rock Ridge Church, how do we describe or define the path to discipleship? Anyone? Love God, love others, serve. What do we mean by love God? Worship. Get to church every week. It's a habit to be cultivated, not a decision to consider. Think about that. Who knows where they're going Monday morning without wondering about it? Right? What do we mean by love others? Life groups. Life groups. Get with a smaller group of people regularly, keyword regularly, Amen. to pray, share each other's lives, get into God's word, and get at the business of becoming more mature Christians. Tip, it doesn't happen in an hour and a half on Sunday morning. This is where we give back to him. God tells us in Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Do we see the day drawing near? Amen. All the more we need to be meeting together, living life together as Christians in smaller groups, micro groups, discipleship, life groups. And what do we mean by serve? Somebody Give somebody a donut out front. Amen. <laughs> Allow God to use you and the gifts that he has given you somewhere in this world. doesn't mean here. We're not, we're not soliciting for volunteers right now. God has given everyone in this room and outside of this room a skill set, a talent, experiences, passions. Use them for him somewhere, anywhere. Get in the game. He tells us to use them for him. If we aren't, we're being disobedient. Think about that. We're being disobedient. When we're doing these three things, loving God, loving others, and serving, then and only then are we becoming his disciples. Becoming his disciples is a never-ending, fantastic journey. If we're not on that journey, you're missing out. As Stephen Curtis Chapman calls it, the great adventure. And it is a great adventure, is it not? These lyrics, 
from Stephen Curtin's chapter and say it great. We'll travel over, over mountains so high, we'll go through valleys below, highs and lows, right? We're not promised just fun times. Still, through it all, we'll find that this is the greatest journey that the human heart will ever see. The love of God will take us far beyond our wildest dreams. He wants more for us than we can even imagine right here now today. Amen. Right? That, amen. That is awesome, is it not? Okay, so we need to work on our spiritual disciplines so we can, among other things, be fertile ground to accept God's blessings, which he wants to pour out on us. Here's a very short list of what we're talking about with spiritual disciplines. There are many lists. This is just one. Meditation. Fasting. Prayer, worship, Bible reading, Bible study, service. What's a couple more? Solitude. Solitude. One more. Anybody? Giving. 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 Amen. Putting ourselves in the habit of practicing spiritual disciplines will allow the Holy Spirit to work on us and change us, and change us for the better. Look how we've allowed ourselves to fall into bad habits. And those changes for the worse, right? What? Okay, AT&T commercial. Guy sitting with a bunch of little kids around him. What's easier, falling into a bad habit or creating good habits? Class? Falling into bad habits, right? Adorable. What's better for us, falling into bad habits or creating good habits? creating good habits. We know this. Just as a reminder, we need to cultivate good habits. We sow what we reap, both positive and negative. Are we sowing negative? Guess what you're going to get. Are we sowing positive? Our behavior and habits form our character. Have you ever heard this saying before? Watch your thoughts, for your thoughts become words. <clears throat> words become actions. Actions become habits. Habits become character, and character determines destiny. The continuum is our thoughts, destiny. Right? God's word says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Do you believe that? What are you thinking about? What habits are we cultivating? All right, so I think you get the picture. We need to cultivate good habits so we become people, the people God wants us to be. He wants us to be fertile ground, ready to accept his truckload of blessings. All right, moving on. The rest of today's message, we're going to break down the prayer of Jabez to glean the nuggets of God's wisdom, which he's trying to get us to see and to apply. Be not just hearers of his words, but doers as well. When reading and studying the Bible, you should take special note of the passages you think are unusual and ask yourself, why is that there? What does he mean by that? What does he want me to learn here? Look at 1 Chronicles 4. Purposely, you can't, purposely, you cannot read that. I'm going to read some of it to you. There's more than two chapters of what I'm about to read to you, okay? In 1 Chronicles 3 and 4 and more. Here it is. The descendants of Judah, Perez, Hezron, Carmi, Hur, and Shobal. Reah, son of Shobal, was the father of Jehath, and Jehath, the father of Ahumai and Lahad. These were the clans of the Zorathites. These were the sons of Etam, Jezreel, Ishma, Idbash. Their sister was named Hezolelponi. Penuel was the father of Gedor, and Ezer, the father of Husha. Have you stopped reading in First Chronicles yet? These were the descendants of Hur. Looks a little bit like Charlton Heston. The firstborn of Ephrathah and father of Bethlehem. That would be a good one to get into. Asher, the father of Tekoa, had two wives, Hela and Nara. Nara bore him Azuham, Hefer. Bad name. <laughs> Some, she must have been painful in childbirth as well. Temeni and Hahashtari. These were the descendants of Nara, the sons of Hela, Zerath, Zohar, Ethnan, and Koz, who was the father of Anub and Hazobeba, 
and of the clans of Arel, son of Haram. And on it goes, except for the very next verse, which says, Now Jabez was more honorable than his brother. Wait, where'd that come from? And his mother called his name Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, that you would keep me from evil, that I might not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. Then right back to the lists. No breath. Caleb, Shuha's brother, was the father of Mehir, who was the father of Eshton. Eshton was the father of Beth Rapha, Pasea, and Tehina, the father of Ir Nash. These were the, name, the men of Raqqa, blah, 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 blah. And on it goes for another whole chapter. So that's bizarre. All right, let's look into that. Why is that there? What is that all about? Why, the, why does the Holy Spirit introduce us to one of these many faceless names, Jabez? What's the Holy Spirit trying to teach us here? Let's break it down. We learned that Jabez was more honorable. Let's look at that in point number two. Number two, fall back to a position of honor. Jabez had a difficult start, but finished strong. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and his mother called his name Jabez, saying, because I bore him in pain. Why is the Lord telling us about Jabez? He's not said a peep about anyone else in the last two chapters of genealogies. In fact, God doesn't even tell us who Jabez's father is. I contend that Jabez is important not because of his lineage, but because he was, quote, more honorable than his brothers. And he has something to say that God wants us to hear. I love the fact that God tells us Jabez was more honorable before he tells us that he was a pain. That's good, <laughs> you know, because I'm a pain. I want to be more honorable as I'm being a pain. The Holy Spirit is a perfect author. Why was Jabez considered more honorable? Let's look at some clues. At verse 9, his mother actually named him Pain because of a difficult childbirth. Imagine his childhood, growing up in elementary school. Oh, here comes that pain again. That would be tough to deal with, right, growing up? Why was he considered, was he considered more honorable because he endured the negative stigma of his name? I don't think that was it. Looking deeper, because of where he's listed in the genealogies, Bible scholars have discerned that Jabez lived in the time after the Israelites crossed over the Jordan River into the Promised Land. They were warring with those living there in order to take possession of the land. However, if you remember, they never completed the task God set before them, did they? They got distracted by the corrupted cultures within which they were living. Jabez was living in a land that was permeated by and corrupted by pagan cultures. In the book of Judges, we get a glimpse of what was going on at the time of Jabez. In Judges 2.10, we see that after the death of Joshua, there arose a generation who did not know the Lord. And then further in Judges 2.11, the sons of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. The Israelites had succumbed to the influence of the world. So, was Jabez more honorable because he did nice things for people? Because he was an outstanding citizen? Because he was wealthy? We're not shown any of this in the short passage. But what we are shown is the very beginning of verse 10. And Jabez called on the God of Israel. There it is. There you have it. Jabez was a godly man. He worshipped God. He communed with God. Not the gods of the culture in which they were living. Not just any god, but the God of Israel. The one true God. Jabez was different than his brothers. He was different than his generation in general. He was in the world, but not of it. He worshipped God in spite of all the worldly behavior going on around him. Jabez was more honorable because of his close relationship with his heavenly father. While others around him chose the gods of the world. Little God, little G. Not much different than our environment today, is it? Can you see the correlation? The fact that Jabez was considered more honorable is evidence of his right relationship with the Lord. You get that equation? 
His honorable life was not due to any good works on Jabez's part. Was Jabez perfect? Certainly not. He was human just like us. He was a pain. Do we need to be perfect to be on God's honor roll, to be more honorable? No way. Can we ever? That is not happening. Let's look at some people listed on God's honor roll. This is a list of biblical examples taken from another church's pastoral search report. They were looking for a new pastor, and let me read you their report. This is pastoral search report to board members. Quote, we do not have a happy report to give. We've not been able to find a suitable candidate for this church, though we have one promising prospect still. We do appreciate all the suggestions from the church members, and we followed up each one with interviews or calling at least three references. The following is our confidential report on the present candidates. Adam, a good man, but problems with his wife. Also, one reference told how his wife and he enjoyed walking nude in the woods. Noah, former pastorate of 120 years with no converts, prone to unrealistic building projects. <laughs> Abraham, though the references reported wife swapping, the fact seemed to show he never slept with another man's wife, but did offer to share his own wife with another man. Joseph, a big thinker but a braggart, believes in dream interpreting and has a prison record. Moses, a modest and meek man, but poor communicator, even stuttering at times, sometimes blows his stack and acts rashly. Some say he left an earlier church over a murder charge. <laughs> David, the most promising leader of all until we discover the affair he had with his neighbor's wife. Solomon, great preacher, but our parsonage would never hold all those wives. Jonah refused God's call into ministry until he was forced to obey by getting swallowed up by a great fish. He told us the fish later spit him out on the shore near here. We hung up on him. <laughs> John says he's a Baptist but definitely doesn't dress like one. Has slept in the outdoors for months on end. Has a weird diet and provokes denominational leaders. Peter, too blue collar, has a bad temper, even has been known to curse. Had a big run-in with Paul in Antioch, aggressive but a loose cannon. Paul, powerful CEO type leader, had a fascinating preacher, however short on tact. Unforgiving with younger ministers, harsh, and has been known to preach all night. <laughs> Timothy, too young. Jesus, has had popular times, but once when his church grew to 5,000, he managed to offend them all, and this church dwindled down to 12 people. Seldom stays in one place very long, and of course, he's single. Judas, his references are solid, a steady plotter, conservative, good connections, knows how to handle money. We're inviting him to preach this Sunday. <laughs> Possibilities here. So you see, we don't need to be perfect people to be considered honorable by God. We do need to have a close relationship with him, though. In 2 Chronicles 16.9, we read, For the eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Our God and Father is looking for those of us who are willing to be more honorable. And here's an important concept to remember and understand. The honorable life is evidence of Christian maturity, not the cause of maturity. Not by works, lest anyone should boast. Question. Do you believe that our God wants to have an intimate relationship with you and through that relationship, he can make you worthy of his blessings? Amen. He does. Jabez did, and God granted him what he requested. God could have stopped there. He could have told us what a great guy this Jabez was and left it at that. But God also wanted us to know what Jabez prayed. Let's look at point number three. Fall back to prayer and ask big. And Jabez called on the God of Israel saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed and enlarge my territory. The word indeed here basically means a whole lot. Jabez is saying, really, really bless me a lot. And enlarging his territory, he meant give him more results for the work of God. Jabez was not being selfish. Since he was more honorable, he wanted God to bless him so that God could do mighty things through him. 
And we see that he was praying in God's will because God granted him what he requested, right? Take it as a whole, and we can see that. If we're doing God's business, God's way, it's only right to ask for more. He's wanting us to ask for more. Why wouldn't he want you to be mighty for him? Any reasons? Why wouldn't he want us to take new territory for him? He wants us to. And look at this. Psalm 37, 4 says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. What are the desires of your heart? Are they like Jabez's? Are they desires that are centered around a big God? Or just a puny little God that's going to help us get through our, you know, irritating coworker today? Right? We need to pray and ask for God to do more through our lives. We need to pray big God prayers and have big God dreams. Is your God big or small? What are you giving him? What are you asking him for? What are you allowing him to do through you, big or small? When we become part of his big plans, he can then bless us big. He can then bless us indeed. But keep in mind, God chooses what form those blessings take. Not us. But who cares? <laughs> Since they're huge God blessings, who cares? Seriously. He can decide whatever blessings he wants to dump on me. I'll take them. Dump away. And right here, let's ask ourselves another reminder question. Why are we here anyway? We're here to do God's work on earth. We're not here with our God-shaped genie in a bottle, asking him to help us fulfill our wills. You know, we, we have our to-do list, and then have God pr we pray over our to-do list. God, make my to-do list happen. We're here to do his work, his way, and when we place ourselves in his hands to do just that, then he blesses us beyond what we can imagine. It's his will, his work, and his power that we simply become a part of. Check this out. Here's just one of the hundreds of promises in God's word. Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 6. And if, by the way, check out the graphic. It's a cool graphic, bottom, bottom left, right, whatever that is, bottom right. Falling in God's hands, backwards, trusting him, right? <laughs> Deuteronomy 28, 1 to 6. And if you faithfully obey the voice of the Lord your God, being careful to do all his commands that I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all nations of the earth, and all these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you. That is awesome. If you obey the voice of the Lord your God, blessed shall you be in the city, and blessed shall you be in the field, Blessed shall be the fruit of your womb and the fruit of, the, of your ground and the fruit of your cattle, the increase of your herds and the young of your flocks. Blessed shall be your basket and your kneading bowl. Blessed shall you be when you come in and blessed shall you be when you go out. What more is there? He's got it covered. Yeah. Oh, that you would bless me indeed. Let the blessings overtake me. I love that. If we're doing God's work, God's way, that's going to happen. And when we ask our big God to do big things through us, we need to be ready to take big steps. Big steps of faith. If we can see every step before us, how much faith does that really take? How much? Anybody have an answer? None. Zip, squat. Thank you, Brian. None. Is that really how we're living? We know the next steps? Okay, I don't know the three steps in front of me, but I know the fourth, so okay, I'm good. I'm good. I can do that. No. Take a moment right now, all of us, ask yourself just exactly what am I doing by faith right now today in my life? Is there anything, each of us, that I'm relying 100% on God to accomplish that I know I cannot do myself? Think about that. If there isn't, you better get one. Okay, as a group, we're currently praying for $1.5 million to com dollars <laughs> to complete God's base of operations on Scott Road. Amen. You know, we call it a base of operations. It's not a church. We ha we'll happen to worship there and hold church there, but it's a base of operations. It's a tool. 
That's a big ask, 1.5 million. God has identified the funds already. Do you believe that? Yes. Amen. He has. He's just waiting for the perfect time for the fertile ground of which we are becoming to reveal its source to us. Amen? But we also have our part to play. We must step into the river while it's at flood stage. Okay? And do the work he's placed before us. Who thinks that if we don't do his work by faith, before he provides the resources, we may never see the results he intends. What's your name? Brendan. Brendan, great answer, Brendan. Good job. Here's another question. If the Israelites had not stepped into the river while it was at flood stage, before God dried it up, would God have dried up the waters. If you're standing there and he's telling you to cross and your whole human brain is saying, there is no way I'm going to cross this on my own. I'm going to get swept away. This is stupid. I can see it. I'm going to get swept away. But yet, I know I'm going to get swept away and I'm stepping into it anyway, knowing you're going to get swept away. That's faith. If we here at Rockridge Church wait until he provides all the answers and gives us all the resources before we take action, we're being disobedient. We remove the faith factor. Our fear and faithlessness circumvents God using us to bring glory to himself and blessings to us. Blessings are just a byproduct. That's all they are. There's a byproduct. His will will still be accomplished. We just won't be part of it. Bummer for us. <laughs> At some point, look up in your Bible and see why Moses didn't get to go over to the promised land. One little boo-boo. Think about that as it relates to you and as an individual as, and also as to us as a church. Step first, then God will. Everything in our minds tells us we shouldn't be doing this. Your friends telling you, what are you doing? You're crazy. Why are you quitting that job and going to do that? Whatever, right? The world is telling you you're wrong. And yet, Everything you know in your heart, not in your head, is telling you, do it. Do it. Who's it whose reputation is at risk? Right. Here's another example of stepping out on faith and trusting in God's word. Watch this. This is Noah. He's 500 years old. Not bad, he doesn't look a day over 350. One day, God told him it was going to rain. No, uh, not rain, it was, it was gonna flood. No, I'm, I mean, really flood. God told Noah he needed to build something that could rescue his entire family and two of every kind of animal on the earth. Let me see a football field. Okay, the ark was one and a half times as long as that football field. You built that? Not bad. It took Noah and his three sons 100 years to build this boat. It's 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. That's almost a million and a half cubic feet. That's the capacity of 522 railroad cars. In the 20s, the Ringling Brothers Circus traveled with their entire operation, which included 335 horses, 26 elephants, and 16 camels, and they traveled in only 92 railroad cars. What I'm trying to say is, that's a big boat. Can you imagine starting with this and trying to get to that? Is it possible that following God means that we pursue crazy big dreams that seem humanly impossible? 
that maybe you and I are called to do things that everybody else would think is crazy, things that when we begin, we can't imagine where they ultimately end. We don't have to complete the journey today, but we have to begin to take the first steps to drive the first nail. We pick up the first board, step out on faith, and we begin to trust God for the rest. That's a big boat. Noah stepped out into the waters by faith and built a big boat. I'll bet he was ridiculed just a little bit. What do you think? Over the course of a hundred years. <laughs> You're still at it. I can't believe it. He wasn't perfect, but what he was con he but he was considered more honorable. And he was willing. Right? He was willing. We need to fall back to prayer and ask big. Nehemiah, when burdened with rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem, asked big. In the book of Nehemiah, we see that while he was in a very high position under King Artaxerxes, he asked the king for, number one, a leave of absence of an undetermined amount of time to go to Jerusalem to rebuild the walls. Number two, he asked for a letter from the king giving him travel authority throughout the whole kingdom, signed by the king. Number three, he asked for a letter to the keeper of the forest, we need one of those, keeper of the forest, to give Nehemiah whatever lumber he might need, blank check, for both the walls, get this, and for Nehemiah's own custom house. And number four, he also asked for captains, a small army, and horsemen to go along with him. That was a big ask, right? That was no small ask. Question, do you believe that our Heavenly Father the one who is able to do more than all we ask or imagine, wants us to ask him to accomplish great things through us? Amen. Yes, he does. He's waiting for us to. He's begging us to. Jabez did, and God granted him what he requested. As we become closer in our relationship with him, as we fall back to prayer, as we ask big, as we are trusting the resources and results to him, and as we do our part, our part on faith, we rely on his help. It's the only way, right? Brings us to point number four. Fall back for his help. Ask God to be with you and work his will through you. Oh, that your hand would be with me. Jabez did not forget to ask that. Oh, that your hand would be with me. How about this? Fall back to the front lines, the front lines of God's battle. As sons and daughters of God, we are expected to attempt things that are too large for us, things that can only be accomplished by God, things that when attempted by us in our humanness, we are guaranteed to fail. If not, we get the glory, not him. We should be praying for God to give us his supernatural power, which he has available to us, to, to accomplish his great things. 2 Corinthians 3, 4 and 6 says, Such is the confidence that we have through Christ toward God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything is coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God, who has made us sufficient to be ministers of a new covenant. Acts 1, 8 but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Zechariah 4.6. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. Joshua 4, 23 and 24. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan for you until you passed over as the Lord your God did to the Red Sea, which he dried up for us until we passed over. Get this, comma. So that all the peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Why did he dry up the Jordan River? To get them to the other side? To give them blessings? Anybody? No. So that all peoples of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty. But they sure got blessed by that, didn't they? They were faithful. They stepped into the waters. They received the benefit of being faithful. God got the glory. Step into the waters and God will take it from there.
poignant pause. It's football season. Look at it this way. We're on God's team. He will get his victory with or without us. If we study his playbook and execute his plays, we get to share in the victory. His victory. But we get to share in it. We get to go to Disneyland. <laughs> or we can sit on the sidelines and watch. Question. Do you believe that the creator of the universe is capable of helping you onto victory as you're fighting battles for him? Do you believe that the creator of the universe is capable of helping you onto victory as you're fighting battles for him? Jabez did, and God granted him what he requested. Are your feet wet? How about your knees? In our final point, we see that not only will God carry us to victory, but he will protect us from evil during the battle. As we come back to the basics of our relationship with him, as we become more honorable, a more honorable repository of his blessings, catch that, he's not going to just dump them anywhere, guys. He's going to put his blessings where he wants to put them, where they will benefit As we pray for big things he wants to accomplish through us, as we step out on faith to do God's work he's called us to do, and we ignore it so often, right? You have this nagging thought. Guess who that is in your brain saying, you should be doing that. Oh, by the way, you should be doing that. You just came across that person. You've been thinking about them. You should be giving them a call. Are we listening? Are we acting? And as we ask him to be with us, we also need to fall back from evil. Ask for protection from evil, not just through it. Avoid it altogether. Jabez prayed, and keep me from evil, from evil, and keep me from evil. He didn't say, and help me through it as I go to the party. Keep me from it. Jabez's final request was a brilliant part in the strategy for sustaining a blessed life. Okay, AT&T commercial, little kids. What sounds easier, battling sin head-to-head -head or avoiding a confrontation altogether? Answer? Avoiding confrontation altogether. Amen. Our most effective prayer against sin that we can pray is that we will not have to fight the unnecessary temptation. The unnecessary temptation. We're going to have temptations. Let's just not ask for more. Right? Let's not wander into more. Let's pray to avoid those that can be avoided. We need the Holy Spirit fighting for us. Our strength, our wisdom, our experience, our feelings, all of our weapons, humanly speaking, are insufficient to adequately protect us. We need God's divine strength, divine wisdom, and divine guidance. Amen? 2 Corinthians 10, 3-6 tells us, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. Well, tomorrow morning, today, this afternoon, when you leave here, you're in a spiritual battle. Don't forget that. And we are ill-equipped for that battle, by the way. We can put on the full armor of God, but we need the Holy Spirit working with us, fighting with us. Where was I? Had I started that yet? <laughs> for though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. You catch that? Let's read that again. We, just, we, with his power, destroy arguments in every lofty opinion. Yeah, I say it. Lofty opinion. He's kind of a little sarcastic there, isn't he? Raised against the knowledge of God. <laughs> lofty opinion. And take every thought captive to obey Christ, being ready to punish every disobedience when your disobedience is complete. With him, we can take every thought captive. What's the continuum? Thought, 
destiny. Right? As a man thinketh, so is he. Listen to this declaration of God's victory on our behalf in Colossians 2, 13 to 15. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him. Together with him. Having forgiven us all our trespasses, we don't have to be perfect. By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, kneeling it to the cross. Who is that? Jesus. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing, by the way, okay, I'm going to get that in a second, by triumphing over them in him. Thank you. The rulers and authorities there that he's talking about are spiritual powers, not human, by the way. So note that. If you don't have a study Bible, get one. By the way, <laughs> tip. We fight a spiritual battle every day, and we need God's power on our side. He is victorious, and we benefit. What a deal. That is an awesome deal. God's equations are beautiful for us, by the way. You know, his if-then statements are always really good for us. Final thought, we see again evidence of Jabez's heart and purpose for praying the way he prayed. We see that he wanted to be used by God for God's purposes as he prayed that I may not cause pain. He wanted to be a blessing to others, not a stumbling block. And what was God's response to Jabez's heart? Quote, so God granted him what he requested. What an awesome prayer that is. But God will not divvy out answers to prayer on unwilling and unworthy people. But only through him can be, be, we be worthy and honorable. So, final question. Do you believe? Do you believe that a supernatural... Don't forget, supernatural, right? I mean, we just... Throw that word out there. God is supernatural. Supernatural God is going to show up to keep you from evil. Is he going to show up? He promises he will. To keep you from evil. And get this. To protect his own spiritual investment. Who are we talking about there? You. Us. Me. Us. Children of God. And to protect his own spiritual investment. I think he's good for it. I think he's good for it. Jabez did, and God granted him what he requested. God gives Jabez as an example for us. We don't need to know Jabez's father, nor his mother. Nor we don't need to know what else he did in his life. We just need to know that Jabez was more honorable than his brothers, and that God granted him what he requested, and we need to learn to be like him. As the band returns, let's look at some next steps. Pay no attention to the band walking up on the stage. Next steps. These are important, by the way. You guys should take the little outline home and look up the verses and Look at the pray over these next steps. I want his blessings to overtake me, you know, and I'm a fast runner. <laughs> I want his blessings to overtake me as I'm trying to run away, do my own thing. So, for that to happen, I want to look at these next steps. Number one, be more honorable, which means love God, attend worship service regularly. Again, it's not a decision to be considered. It's a habit to be cultivated. Love others. Be involved on a regular basis with a smaller group of Christians. You have to, have to, have to, have to, have to do that. You have to do that. You have to do that. 
and serve somewhere, anywhere. Just ask him, show me, where can I serve? And he'll show you. You know, try something. If you don't like it, try something else. God's wired us all to like what we're doing for him, by the way. You know, that's a really cool thing. By the way, in my earlier Christian days, I thought, my gosh, since I'm not out street evangelizing, I'm not a real Christian. You know, well, he didn't wire me for that. Apparently, he wired me for this and some other things. So, amen to that. I don't have to do the things that he's not telling me to do. All I have, like what, what, Amy Grant, all I have to be in is what he's made me. Figure out what that is. What did he make you? And go be it. It's not that tough. Number two, pray big God prayers. Not small God prayers. Yes, he wants your car fixed. But maybe not today. You know? Big God prayers. Pray for help. We cannot do it. Pray for protection. We cause enough trouble of our own. Well, I'll speak for myself. I cause enough trouble for myself. Pray for protection. I don't need myself getting myself into more trouble. And finally, fall back to God as he takes you beyond your wildest dreams on his great adventure. There's a reason why we call the discipleship the great adventure, our, our discipleship ministry, because it is. And you really won't discover it until you are on it. But it's pretty cool. All right, let's pray. Father, today we cannot help but fall back once again. We fall back to praying the same prayer Jabez prayed. We pray, oh, that you would bless us indeed. Bless us by working great things for yourself through us that you would enlarge our territory. Reach, Lord, many thousands for yourself through this church, that your, word, your, that your hand would be with us and keep us from evil, that we may not cause pain. Holy Spirit, protect us from ourselves, that we may be examples of Christ for others and not stumbling blocks. We pray that you would grant us these requests for your glory, not ours. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Before the band goes. <laughs>